was here not that long ago, actually. So it's Wes that hasn't been here <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have been. So anyway, great to be here with you. It's a lovely day. I'm along, along with Wes, I feel completely intimidated by all the brains in the room. So the longer I've been in ministry, the more I've realized that uh, my primary gift you know, different people have different gifts. Mine is making complex things incredibly simple. So I'm probably going to, you're going to walk out of here with all those big brains of yours saying, well, he made that complex thing incredibly simple. He might be dumb. And you would probably be right. But we're going to talk about faith today. And so we've been singing a little bit about the faithfulness of God, those kinds of things. And uh, that, of course, is resoundingly yes. And you sing about his worthiness and say that he is worthy. All those things are very true. What's sometimes more difficult is not thinking about the faithfulness of God, but thinking about our life of faith, which is maybe at times a little bit shakier. So I'm wondering if you ever think that faith, faith for you, faith that you're operating on the basis of is out of your reach. If you ever wonder if you're going to have like real faith that we talk about when you come to church and say, can I have that kind of faith, you know, the big kahuna kind of faith, the alpha dog kind of faith, world-changing kind of faith, the faith that believes God for the truly impossible, the kind that risks in tremendous and uses tremendous courage to step out for God, faith that inspires people, faith that people talk about for generations, faith that alters the direction of a society. Faith even that allows established older churches like Dunbar Heights Baptist Church to prosper, to reach the loss, to see people change, to see a community change when the city of Vancouver around us seems to go crazy and go in all kinds of bizarre directions. And we start asking, like, how is that working for us? Do we believe and act in faith as a church and as individual people within a church to believe God wants to do something pretty remarkable. Or maybe, maybe you don't set your sights quite so high. Maybe it's simply you ask yourself, could I even have the faith to go through an entire week and never doubt the existence of God? Just go through a week and truly act day by day like the person I claim to be, like the person that people see on Sundays. Because I read about faith and I read about kind of the world of faith. I'm kind of a binge reader, so I binge on biographies for a while, then I binge on other things. When I'm binging on biographies, I often find that the people we write biographies about in the Christian faith are about faith. So, for example, George Mueller in the 1800s literally had 50 cents in his pocket, and he started five orphanages in Bristol, England, and by the time he had finished his life, he had helped and shared the gospel with over 10,000 children. But he started with 50 cents. And I think, okay, would I do that? And I'm thinking, probably not. I, I don't see it. Or people that we know a little bit better, perhaps, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian who resisted the genocide of Jews during World War II. In the end, he was arrested. He was put in a concentration camp, and he was hung two weeks before the people were released from the camp in 1945. And yet some of his books last on as sort of examples of faith, how to live in faith in incredibly difficult times. And I look at what he did, what he wrote, what he said as he was going through that process, and I think, do I have that kind of faith? And I think, hmm, hmm, maybe not. And of course, there's plenty of amazing stories just within this church itself with these people. Mayan told a great story. We had our uh, conference together a couple months ago. I'm sure Wes mentioned this to you at some point. Mayan was one of our speakers. She did a great job of talking about kind of her own journey and faith coming in, in it to believe that she's a child of God at the end. Great story of faith. Wes is a man who demonstrates faith. Glenn Bowles, who I've known a long time, has demonstrated faith. And look around. Kent Anderson, who's normally here, who leads Northwest, is a person of faith. And you look at these guys and you think, isn't it great? And then I go look in a mirror, and I'm less sure. <laughs> it is sad. <laughs> less sure. And I'm wondering if serving God meaningfully is what I do every day or not. 
because very often it just feels a little bit like it's inadequate, it's not quite there. You know, so Hebrews, which we're looking at, Hebrews chapter 11, if you've got your Bibles, it tells us that without, in verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And Hebrews 11, of course, is kind of the most famous passage about faith heroes, or heroes of the faith. And it's the people who set the standard. It's the best of the best. It's the all-stars. It's the guy in free agent frenzy of faith who's getting the most money. It's those guys right there. And we know how it starts, the old King James Version, if you ever memorized it, then you know how this goes. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, do you remember? Not seen. Substance of things you hope for, evidence of things not seen. And I think about that, and I think most of us, most of the people I experience and myself, we live our life on the evidence of things we've already seen, rather than the things we haven't seen. The NIV writes it this way. It says, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. That's what the ancients were commended for. Uh, Eugene Peterson, in his version of the message, says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. So the question for you this morning, which is mine as well, is, is your faith strong enough? Is it real enough? Is it rock solid? Is it your fortress in times of trouble? Is it Gibraltar when the storms are hitting? Does it stand the test of time? Is it vibrant? Is it life-altering? Do you believe it can change the world around you when you act in faith? So you have to step outside. You're in church on Sunday morning. I get it. It's warm out. The sun's shining. Ask yourself, is that true of you? Not just in sermon world, not just for church, but day by day, Monday, Tuesday, is that true? So when I th think of myself in this, uh, my general conclusion is I don't have enough. <laughs> I don't have enough. In fact, the amount that I do have, I kind of think of, this is my own phrase, you won't find this in the Bible. I, the amount of faith I have, I call pity faith. Pity faith is the pathetic little amount God stuck in me because I couldn't get my own. So he just gave me this amount of pity faith because he's amazed that I was even willing to do a sermon about faith. So God's up in heaven and he's gathering the archangels around, which depending on who you ask is either Michael or Michael or Gabriel or Michael, Gabriel and five others. And he's anyway, he's gathering them around. He's saying, hey, check this guy out. He's talking about faith. Doesn't he know that if he had the faith of a mustard seed, he could move mountains? In fact, didn't we sing a song about that? <laughs> and didn't we sing, and I believe he can do it again? Yeah. Did, did you guys sing that? Yeah. How many of you like that song? How many of you believe that song? No, I mean, really, how many of you believe that song? Okay, so all of you who believe that song should go out with me and let's move a piece of gravel. <laughs> right? And I think God sometimes looks at me and he says, hey, check this out. Faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And he's actually doing a sermon on it. It's kind of a sad level of faith compared with the real thing we see in the Bible, isn't it? So if you look at these examples of faith in Hebrews 11, just look at a few of them with me. And we're just going to touch on them because we don't have time to read it all. Let's look at, say, Abraham. Great example of faith. Verse 8. This is what the author writes. He says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, not a good statement, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. That's faith. Abraham. Let's check out Moses. Look in verse 24. It says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You remember this story. And he went off in the wilderness. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God 
rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. Moses, who turned away from the opportunity to belong to the royal household, went off in the desert, came back to lead all of God's people out of Egypt. Verse 27, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Or we can go on, starting in verse 32. It says, What more shall I say? I don't have time to talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword. He goes on and on about these people. Tremendous list of faith heroes. Gideon, who led Israel in this huge victory over the Midianites with 300 men. If you remember the story, we got ah, too many. Get rid of some of them, too many, because it had to be about faith, like real trust in God. Remember Barak, who defeated Sisera in his heavily armed chariots, or Samson, who had huge, huge strength to defeat Philistine armies, or David, the greatest king in Israel's history, a man after God's own heart. They deserve to be there. Kicker, of course, is in verse 13 and 39. Verse 13 says this. It says, all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Or verse 39 says, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, that only together with us would they be made perfect. Not only did these guys have faith, they had delayed faith. Delayed faith. So psychologists would tell us that delayed gratification is a sign of maturity. This is delayed faith. That's even better. It's faith in something you never see, you never get, you die, and it never happens. And you live in faith nevertheless. No wonder these guys are listed here. Faith is a very good idea. We should get some. <laughs> Write that down. That's my simple point that all of you with a big brain will be offended by. Faith is a great idea. We should get some. They were all commended for their faith. You know what? I bet we'd be really encouraged if we looked even more at these guys' faith. Really encouraged. So let's look a bit more at Abraham. Go back to Genesis 17, way back. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can look in Genesis 17, verse 1. This is where Abraham had this huge promise, and uh, this is a renewal of a covenant that had already been made in chapter 12 to Abraham, that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, that he'd be the father of God's people. In fact, the people would be as numerous as the sands of the seashore, as numerous as the stars in the sky. It says in verse seven, or chapter 17, Genesis, verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you fruitful. Seems pretty good. That's the promise that he's affirmed for. That's the promise that's brought up in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Faith Hall of Fame. Pick it up again in verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, Sarah, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell down and he laughed to himself, saying, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Remember back Hebrews 11, and he as good as dead. They're talking about having kids. Having kids. Abraham fell down and laughed to himself. Will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah, Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael could live under your blessing. Good news here, promise of God to Abraham. God's faithfulness, absolute. Bad news? Bad news? 
Well, Abraham had got a little impatient with that promise. If you remember your Old Testament story at all, in 13 years earlier when he was 86, which seemed old enough for him, Sarah, Sarai at the time, had made this little thought, you know what, you're going to be the father of many nations. That's not really working out for us. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. Why don't you sleep with my handmaiden and then have a baby that way? And in one of the understated verses demonstrating that men are pigs, by the way, in Genesis, it says, Abraham agreed. <laughs> Abraham agreed. So he went off on his own way 13 years before, and when God tells him, by the way, I'm still keeping my promise to you when you're 99, it says that Abraham fell down and laughed. He said, why don't you just give the blessing to the child I had from the handmaid? Great faith. Right? Or we could go on and look in chapter 20 where Abraham goes in the Negev desert and Abimelech, the king there, is a little bit dangerous and Abraham thinks that his wife Sarah is a pretty good-looking woman and the king might want her, so he decides that he might get killed by the king in order to have the king marry his wife, Sarah. So he just lies to the king and says, Sarah, by the way, is my sister. Do whatever you want. Indecent proposal of the early version. Great faith. Inspiring, really. All right, let's look at Moses, because um, Moses is probably a better example. Abraham's kind of fallen through the cracks here. If you go to Exodus, Exodus with me, Exodus chapter 3, remember in Hebrews chapter 11, it's telling Moses had this great faith. He was unwilling to accept the treasures of royalty, instead wanted to lead Israel out of Egypt and be used by God in powerful, mighty ways. Remember that? That's how that works in Hebrews 11. So God comes to Moses in a burning bush, we're told, in chapter 3 of Exodus. And we'd all love God to come to us in a burning bush, because if God could come to us in a burning bush, we would have faith. Like, it wouldn't be just things we don't believe. We'd see it right here. Here's God through an angel, through a theophany, maybe even pre-incarnate Christ, we're not sure, speaking to us. If God spoke to us that way, our faith would be incredible. And so we're told that Moses was there and he was told to take off his sandals. He's standing on the holy ground and God says to him, okay, I want you to be a hero of the faith. I want you to go lead Egypt out of it. And so out of, or leave, lead Israel out of Egypt. And so Moses jumps at the chance. So verse 11, Moses says to God, uh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Me? I'm not important enough. God says, no, really, you. So Moses goes back in verse 13, and he says, well, suppose I go to them, and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What shall I tell them? I'm not really a theologian, God. I don't really have all those details worked out. I've been kind of in an Egyptian family. I didn't really grow up with Jewish people. I haven't got all this stuff figured out. I don't really know enough about you. You should get somebody else. And God says, no, really, Moses, I had you in mind. So in chapter 4, verse 1, Moses says, well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? And they say, the Lord didn't appear to you. They aren't going to believe me anyway. And God says, no, getting tired of this, it's you, Moses. Moses goes on, verse 10, he says, well, look, I've never been eloquent. Verse, this is chapter 4, verse 10. Neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant, I'm slow of speech and tongue. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not the guy for this job. God... And he finally, in verse 13 of chapter 4, gets to the bottom line, and he says, in his fifth excuse to God, okay, Lord, here's the bottom line. Send somebody else. That's the Moses that's appearing in the New Testament in Hebrews 11 as the great example of faith who led Israel out of Egypt. That's the one. Clearly, whoever wrote Hebrews, and we're not sure who that was, knew what he was talking about when he said it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Because we sure didn't see it. Is that right? Is that right? Hmm. Okay, well, we can probably do better with David. Let's try Psalm 13, for example. Because David's a man after God's own heart. I really like him. 
He has a good name. <laughs> Psalm 13 says this. David's talking to God. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Every day you have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. My enemy will say I've overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. Good news in, he goes on, he says, but I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. One of the things I like about David is if you read, he writes his own kind of epitaph when he's dying at the end of uh, 2 Samuel and he says, I'm a son of Joseph, Israel's singer of songs. He never said he was Israel's mightiest king. He never said he was a man after God's own heart. He said, I'm a child of Joseph. And if you remember your Old Testament, Joseph was a liar, a deceiver, all those things. So he doesn't say anything else. He claims, look, this is who I am, deceptive to my core. That's who I've always been. And I'm not the greatest warrior, but I love God out of my heart, and I sang songs about him. Remember me for those two things. I think that's why he was a man after God's own heart. Not because everything he did was right, but at the heart he had humility, understood who he was, and understand the struggles that he was going with. You know, we could go on through like this all through Hebrews 11. We could talk about Gideon hiding in a hole in the ground when God says to him, Oh, mighty warrior. We could talk about the Apostle Peter giving in to peer pressure. We could talk about Jephthah making a terrible covenant with God in the Old Testament. And it leads you to wonder when you start looking through Hebrews 11, did the guy who was writing even know what he was talking about? Is there anybody there who had a rock-solid faith? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. How do you stand the test of close examination? Is there even one person? Is there even one person who can actually get a perfect score on this, be commended for their faith? Is there even one? And I would suggest there's exactly one. Just one. Just one. And that's why he's our model. That's why he's our example. It's why... Our faith is in him, not in ourselves. And the tricky part about faith is it's never about us. You know, we'll even talk about things like, hey, let's go move a mountain. No, no, I'll give that up. Way too big. Let's move a piece of gravel. And somewhere in our head, in our world that we're living in today, we think it's like Harry Potter. You know, we go with a magic wand, we wave, and our power is channeled into the rock, and the rock moves. When faith by its nature is never about us, It's got nothing to do with us. It's got everything to do with Jesus. It's always about the degree to which we have trusted God, trusted the Son of God, trusted the work of the Spirit of God. And the moment our faith is focused anywhere else, we've lost. That's why you go through all of Hebrews 11 saying all these guys were commended for their faith. They lived, this is what they did, this is what they did. You go to the Old Testament and say, that's not exactly what they did. But you'll notice in Hebrews 11, they'll say it was done through their belief in Christ, which is why then in Hebrews 12, he'll turn around and say, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that is the people who've walked this journey of faith, throw off everything that hinders the sin that's so easily entangled. Let us run with perseverance, a race marked out for us. Why? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's one. There's just one. There is nobody in the history of mankind, there is nobody in this room, there is nobody in their pew, and not one of you. And if you want to challenge us, feel free. Come knock me out on this later on. There is not one of you in here, including me, who's got this faith thing perfect. The greatest men, the greatest women of faith struggle to make sense of the world in which they live. I'm not saying mistakes are good. I'm not saying failing to have faith is a positive thing. I'm just saying that a real life of real faith in the real world is not a fairy tale. It's not a feel-good, easily, easy-listening podcast. It's not a movie where everything is simple, everything seems straightforward, the good guy always gets the girl. 
That's not the walk of faith that we've been called to. Because real life, faith, in the real world, is a real fight. And thoughtful people, and you guys all have these big brains, remember? Thoughtful people who have the courage to t tell themselves the truth look at life and have questions. Look at life and struggle with some elements of it. They debate, we debate, I debate, whether good triumphs over evil when we look at the world around us. We question why things happen the way we do. We fight internal battles of belief and fear, external battles of doing the right thing at the right time. Real people know that their own faith is not enough. When we focus it on ourselves and we try to live our life out of that, we are in deep trouble. Because it was never about our faith. It's about faith in. Faith in Christ. It's not just an issue, simple issue of building up spiritual hype so we can say we believe it. Real faith in real life is a real fight. That's why there's a famous prayer in Mark 9, which I love, which becomes part of my regular sort of personal devotional life, where I'm praying along with a man who wanted his, an evil spirit cast out of his son, and Jesus says to him, well, okay, do you have enough faith for that? And he says, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Because we're struggling to get there. But somehow in Western Christian culture, we have achieved this false sense of reality about faith that allows for no struggles, no questions, no mistakes. We have this false faith in front of people, an illusion of reality, a distortion of truth, and it hurts every one of us who try to walk in faith together in a community that's called the body of Christ. Because we lie to ourselves and we lie to each other, we don't tell the truth because it seems like we're weak. Seems like we're struggling. And we're thinking that everybody else around us, the other people in there, have it all together, and that's not true. So that's the reason for this sermon. Really simple. I have all kinds of conversations. Part of my job is to kind of wander around the province, and I talk to leaders in churches and to just people in churches. And I get in these conversations with people where their faith has been rocked by real events. I trust, I pray that's true just within your own body here. I appreciated Wes as he was leading us in prayer, talking about people come in with their celebrations and their sorrows and struggles. Because the more we tell those, the more we share those, the better and the stronger our body is. It seems counterintuitive, but it's true. Because people feel inadequate, they feel weak, they feel sometimes, we all feel sometimes like we've let God down. A couple times recently I had people say to me, people wouldn't understand if I told them because their faith is rock solid. And so I'm here to tell you that's not true. If they're saying it, they're either lying to you or lying to themselves or both. Or both. And I've had all kinds of discussions with people who feel they can't go on because somehow they believe their spiritual faith isn't strong enough or they haven't worked out enough celestial brownie points with God by behaving perfectly. And you don't behave perfectly. I've met some of you. <laughs> Real faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And because that's true and because God is at work within us, there are times we act heroically. We act like the people of Hebrews chapter 11. But because we're human and we're striving against a sin nature and a sin-saturated world, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't. And God does not drop us from his scorecard when we struggle. God does not say you're not good enough. He doesn't vote you off the island. He doesn't tell you you're last in the race. He doesn't erase your name from the book of life. He doesn't decide you're not worth the trouble. He doesn't say you're not good enough to serve him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, but real faith in a real world is a real struggle. And we do all of ourselves in our churches a disservice if we pretend something else is the case. We hurt one another, and we hurt ourselves. So let me just finish by encouraging you in three areas, really simply. First is this, you need to give yourself a break. Sometimes you just need to give yourself a break. You aren't perfect, and God is painfully aware of it. 
Even if you think you are, God is still painfully aware that you are not perfect. He's got that figured out. Even if it's a surprise to you, it is not a surprise to God. They're not gathering the archangels up there and saying, whoa, if David messes this up, my entire kingdom plan is shot. Jesus is not saying, whoa, David's doing another sermon on faith. What is he thinking? After that, everybody in Dunbar is going to go out. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to rock their world. Everything that I ever planned is kaput because David messed it up. You're not that important. I'm not that important. God's got a plan. He's got that taken into consideration somehow. I don't know how. That's beyond me. But he will do what God wants to do, and he will do it with me, in me, through me, and even take into account that it is me. And you as well. And perhaps if chapter 11 of Hebrews is true, that is, we read it and don't make it say something it's not saying, then perhaps God will tell the stories of our best faith moments, not our worst. Maybe that's why Abraham is there. That's why Moses is there. That's why David is there. That's why Jephthah is there. That's why Gideon is there. And maybe it will be because of our one great faith moment where we made a commitment to trust in Jesus Christ and God chooses to see us through that lens was never about our perfection. It was always about his. So first thing, give yourself a break. Second thing is this, tell others the truth. Start telling each other the truth. And you're going to be amazed at how many people have the same struggle, ask the same questions, wonder about the same things. And too often they're coming in and out of church saying the things they think they're supposed to say. And because we don't say what's true, we don't say what we're questioning, we don't say what we're struggling in, we don't get to help each other. We don't get to build each other up. So contrary to all external appearances, nobody's faith in here is rock solid. I've met one person, this sounds obnoxious, but go with me. <laughs> I've met one person in my life who told me they never sin and their faith is perfect. And I walked away from that conversation saying, that person is a fool. I have never met somebody more set up for pain and a fall than that one person. Never. Maybe Hall of Fame type faith is less about perfection, more about the struggle, and more about seeing Jesus. Focusing on him. And remember, the writer of Hebrews, which you may not know, probably knew the Old Testament way better than we do. They probably had it all memorized. They knew every problem that Moses had. They knew every problem that Abraham had. They knew every problem about every person that they wrote in here. So let me just reassure you, nobody in here whose faith is so strong, so perfect, that they have no struggles. Give yourself a break. Tell each other the truth. Tell each other the truth. Third, final thing, continue to work at growing your faith. Continue to work at it. It is a growth industry. And it is centered solely and entirely on our identity in Jesus Christ. Knowing who we are, knowing that our faith is never going to be sufficient. It is our identity in Christ through his work on the cross, calling us to himself so that God sees us as perfect through the eyes of Christ and the work of Christ. That's why we can walk in faith. So we need to keep appropriating that identity, that person, who we are in Christ, and live that out. Remember that our faith will never be perfect, but there's tremendous opportunity for serious investors. Remember that our faith is never going to be perfect, but there will be moments when we can behave heroically enough that we would be on a memorial wall as well. Remember, it's never going to be perfect. But maybe through that struggle, we can grow. Maybe through that struggle, our faith will get deeper. Maybe through that struggle, we will conform more and more and more to the image of Jesus, who we're called to, and we're called to the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, and both of those go hand in hand. And maybe when we do that, we'll get to the end of Psalm 13 and say with David, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. So I encourage you, have an authentic, honest faith. But whatever you do, do not confuse it with perfection. Let's pray together.
Father, so simple and so hard. And we acknowledge today, I acknowledge today, that too often I look at passages in the New Testament sometimes, like Hebrews 11, and feel inadequate, feel guilty, feel incomplete, like I'm not doing, being what you want me to be. So Father, help us to have clear eyes to see the people of this passage and the other people of the New Testament as real people living in a real world struggling for real faith. Father, help us to fix our eyes upon your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Help us to look nowhere else, to seek it in no one else, and to never look for it in ourselves. Father, be honored by the life we live. Be honored even by the struggle we have to achieve what you've called us to. And we pray in the name of your Son who completes it and will call us into glory with him. Amen.